Admiral Thomas M. Dyke is retired. The story we are about to bring you is based upon the USS Thresher's 5th and 6th patrols during the Second World War under her amazingly aggressive skipper, Lieutenant Commander William J. Milliken. It proves that men are the most important factor in victory and that a ship, no matter how modern and well-equipped, is only as good as her crew. Back in 1928 at the U.S. Naval Academy, Midshipman William J. Milliken was learning early in his career the importance of teamwork. Nicknamed Moke, the scrappy midshipman never tipped the scales at more than 150 pounds. But to his teammates at Annapolis, Moke Milliken was worth his weight in gold. Whatever he lacked in size and weight, Moke Milliken made up in courage and determination as he ripped through the opponent and compiled an outstanding academy record. In June of 1928, Midshipman Milliken graduated from Annapolis to begin his career in the United States Navy. Early in World War II, Lieutenant Commander Milliken saw his dream of commanding a submarine become a reality. After several successful patrols as skipper of the S-18, he took command of the USS Thresher. His executive officer was Lieutenant Bob Brinker of Park Ridge, Illinois. The gunnery officer was Lieutenant Larry V. Julin from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Lieutenant James Bryant of Pasadena, California was the submarine's diving officer. On a fifth war patrol, the Thresher completed the first part of her mission, a daring mine plant inside the Gulf of Siam. Hey, that's a beautiful job, Bob. 32 mines laid in a perfect U around Bangkok Bar. Yeah. Set our course southwest. Let's haul out of here. Oh, we got to find some targets for those torpedoes. Don't want to haul them back to Perth. Southwest it is, Captain. 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 Smoke on the horizon. Be right up, Bob. closer and get a better look. Take it down. Near the bridge. Dive! Dive! At 0745, the thresher slipped beneath the surface and headed toward the possible target. They were in dangerously shallow waters of Macassar Straits, near Macassar City. She's right off Kapapasang Island. The long reef to the west. Apparently she's run aground. Down scope. I hate to waste torpedoes on a cripple. Let's move into 3,000 yards. We'll battle surface. Go after her with our pop gun. That's for me, Captain. The thresher surfaced at an estimated 3,000 yards, and Captain Milliken sent his crew to battle stations. The enemy ship was using all efforts to clear the reef and was a sitting duck, an easy target for the sub's three-inch gun. All battle stations manned and ready. ammunition, the three-inch gun crew pounded away. We've unloaded better than 20 rounds, Captain. At least 17 direct hits. She should have sunk by now. Keep after it. The gun crew pounded on, unloading another 20 rounds of three-inch ammunition into its target. 
Though they set it afire, the Japanese ship seemed unsinkable. The three-inch shells didn't carry enough authority to do the job. She won't go down, Captain. Have them keep that ammo coming. We'll sink that rust bucket if we have to use every last shell we've got for that pea shooter. have they fired, Bob? About 70. We're using more ammunition than that tub is worth. Might as well be throwing rocks. She's going, Bob. Finally. Right, full rudder. All ahead, one third. Right, full rudder. All ahead, one third. Japanese merchantman was finally destroyed, but the men of the Thresher did not consider it much of a victory. It had taken better than 80 rounds of ammunition to do the job, in a calm sea with nobody shooting back at them. What's eating you, Larkin? You've been going around all day looking like a whipped hound dog. Well, it's that miserable pea shooter up on deck. I figured we should have dunked that ship with less than 20 rounds. The old man's pretty teed off, too. Skullbutt has it he's gonna ask for a bigger deck done when we finish this patrol. Boy, I sure hope so. <laughs> Being gunpointer on a converted slingshot ain't exactly a pleasure. Charles? Please. Sounded like it came from the forward torpedo room. on the impulse lines to see if they were closed before testing. She must have hit the outer door and stuck. You're a first-class torpedo man, Larkin. How could you fail to check your valves before testing? I don't know, sir. Oh, what a dumb stunt. We'll talk about that later. Right now, we've got a hot torpedo in this tube. We better get it out before it blows up the ship. The life of the Thresher and her men was in extreme jeopardy. They were 180 miles off Japanese-held bases with a hot torpedo jammed in the tube and no way of knowing when it might explode. Keep the vent of the tube open. Let the pressure release itself. Yeah, the tube's pretty hot, Captain. The torpedo must have burned itself out. And I'm gonna surface. Larry, get a man over the side. See if the warhead is protruding beyond the outer door. Aye, aye, sir. On the surface, in heavily infested enemy waters, a diver was sent over the side to inspect the tube through the shutter door. All hands were aware of the extreme danger. If the warhead of the torpedo had been exposed to the open sea, it could explode at any time. The diver found the shutter door was pried open about two inches, but with the door forced outward, he was unable to see the warhead. Well, there's a slim chance that warhead's not armed. But we can't be sure. We can get a small rod through the tail stop buffer on the inner door, Captain. We'll be able to find out just how far up in the tube she is. Right. In the meantime, I'll radio the force commander what we're doing. Just in case. The torpedo's about six inches forward in the tube, sir. That means the war heads out. Out about three inches past the end of the tube. She's armed. They now knew what the trouble was. It was serious trouble. The next step was to get something done about it. We've got to get the outer end of the torpedo tube out of the water. Trim the boat down aft. That'll raise the bow. And we can open the inner tube door without flooding the ship. Alert the visual and sound watch. If the enemy spots us now, we'll have about as much chance as a clay duck in a shooting gallery. Yeah, it'll take about three quarters of an hour to pump everything back aft. Check. Anything we can do in the meantime, Captain? Yeah. Pray. Our 
engine stopped to avoid the possibility of any magnetic disturbance setting off the torpedo, the thresher was trimmed down aft and a three degree rise angle lifted her bow out of the water. With every swell of the seas, tension mounted. The men were now battling a dangerous new enemy, time. They had to disarm a very touchy torpedo before the enemy found them. The inner door of the tube was opened and then began the grueling task of attempting to pull out the torpedo. Bridge. Captain, we got the wire cable secured to the tail assembly, Captain. Get right down. Looks like she's expanded from the heat, Captain. Well, you'll have to take it slow. It's got to be a steady pull, no sudden jerks. Yes, sir. All right, let's go. It was like trying to repair a fine watch while wearing boxing gloves. The job required a delicate touch, yet the only way to do it was to manhandle the torpedo. We all knew that an extra jerk, the slightest jar, even an unexpected vibration, might at any second set off the warhead, sending them all to the bottom. She's moving! Keep her coming! Hold it! Scraping against the side. Now, Larry, we've got to get it out. All together now. Okay, Captain, she's disarmed. The outer door is jammed open. And we can take a chance and stay on patrol. But if we get a depth charge close aboard, it's liable to rupture the inner door. You know what that can mean? It'll force my under. Return to base immediately. In view of your situation, make every attempt to avoid combat. Well, I guess that solves our problem. Uh, thanks, Chief. You guys sure got me out of a jam. 
Hey, look, you guys, I'm sorry I goofed. I know it was a bad mistake, but I couldn't... It's not the first time we've ever had to turn back from duty assigned, Larkin. When we get back, why don't you do us a favor? Ask for a transfer. Back at the submarine base at Fremantle, West Australia, Thrush's damage was quickly repaired. But Commander Milliken's hope of his sub being equipped with more modern armament hit a snag. In December of 1942, newer deck guns were scarce in the Pacific. She had to settle for an old relic. You mean all they could give us is this old 5-inch 51 blunderbuss? We gotta make it work somehow. The way Iloc has been running, it figures they'd stick us with a piece of scrap iron like this. What do you suppose they'll give us for ammunition? Cannonballs? <laughs> yeah, but the skipper won't be disappointed. I'll make this old cannon work. Well, I guess all we can do is try. Unless well, somebody's got any better suggestions. I got a suggestion, sir. At least we can get a gun pointer on it we can trust. I'd like to request a transfer, sir. What's the matter? Is it getting too rough for you? Oh, Captain, I can't live aboard a ship where, where everybody's giving me the silence treatment. Larkin, you made a big mistake. All right. But if you leave this boat now, you'll be making the biggest mistake of your life. No, you, you'd be better off without me, sir. I'm captain of this boat. I want you to stay. It won't be easy. But it won't be half as rough as quitting. You're a submariner. Prove it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I'll give it a try, sir. The Thresher set out again on her sixth war patrol. And on December 29, 1942, she was patrolling off Surabaya in the Java Sea in search of enemy shipping. Notify the captain, smoke off starboard bow. It's like she's Singapore bound, making good speed. We'll surface and get up ahead of her before diving. Let's hope those fish we've got aren't duds. That's a nice fat press board. Lay the bridge! the Thresher slowly swung into position at close range. And the order to fire the first torpedo was given. Dad, fire two! Torpedoes without a single hit. You can't get him with these fouled up fish. That's too good a target to pass up. You thinking of trying to get her with that five inch relic on deck? Right. Can't let that one get away. Stations for battle service. Bob, take the car. Right. 
Where? Oh, Captain, I can't see a thing through these sights. We'll have to make our own. I'll need a volunteer to stay up here with me and help. You got one, sir. Good. Let you make it behind the conning tower. I'm going to lash my glasses right onto this sight yoke. And we'll use the other pair to sight through the breach. We're going to foresight this gun right smack onto the target. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Get this in here tight. Yeah, that ought to hold it. Get in there, quick. Mark, Mark, Mark. Down a little. Mark, Mark. Down a fraction. Mark, Mark. On target. It's all yours, Larkin. Call the gun crew back. Gun crew! the crew fired shell after shell into the hull of the large transport, but not without taking a beating themselves. Each time the five-incher was fired, the recoil action shook the thresher as though she were a toy. But they weren't facing an unarmed tanker. This sitting duck had teeth. Turning the ramp. Load, load! Ready, go! We hit the bow gun. We're moving in fast. the belly. Going down. Not enough. Right for runner. He's going down. Cease fire. Great job, men. The Larkin, you still want that transfer? Ah, uh, Captain, I think maybe I'd like to stick around for a while. Okay. Oh, Captain! Yeah. Thanks, Captain. I'll be back in a moment with my special guest. This story is our tribute to the fine ship's company of the USS Thresher, and especially to those who later gave their lives in carrying the fight to the enemy. Among them were Captain Milliken and the Executive Officer Bob Brinker. And now I'd like to introduce Rear Admiral Lawrence V. Julin, retired, who was the Thresher's torpedo and gunnery officer. Larry, we know that Thresher had a rough time with the shortage of good torpedoes, but you boys seem to have done all right without them. Well, as you know, in 42, there was a shortage of almost everything aboard submarines. But at least with Moke Milliken as skipper, there was one thing you never had to worry about. What was that, Larry? There was never a shortage of morale. The Thresher was overstocked in that department. I'm very proud to say that I knew Moke very well. He had lots of fight. At the same time, he was a kind and considerate leader. No submarine could have wanted a better skipper. And we had some of the best men in the business, too. There was Red Whitehouse, the first-class torpedoman, who went over the side to check the position of the burned-out torpedo, and then later on removed the delicate exploder mechanism. And another was the first loader, on the deck gun, Gardner Paulus from Huntington, West Virginia. He did a magnificent job when he loaded every five-inch shell we had on board without rest or interruption. Yes, it's strange what phenomenal feats of strength people have performed under the excitement of combat. Larry, it's fine to have had you with us. Thank you, Tommy. I hope you will be with us again for another true story of the silent service. <laughs>